So please put your hands together. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all bright and cheery this morning. It's a, another big session. If anyone went to my session yesterday, that's probably a little bit more full on than that. Um, and it's 90 minutes, of course, not three hours. We usually do this as a three-hour workshop. Um, so we're going to pack in a lot of stuff today and hopefully give you guys some real good insight into how to rehab people who've had ACL. Um, especially some of you, have anyone had an ACL reconstruction in here? Okay, good, quite a few. And clients that you've got ACL recons? Yeah, good. It's some good numbers there. Um, like I said, it's very jam-packed this session, and I'll welcome questions up any time, as long as we've got time for them. Um, but today, what you've sort of got to think about is what we're going to go through. Um, for you, those in the crowd, who is a PT versus a physio? Who's the PTs in the crowd? Most of you have been physios in the crowd? Okay, great. So you two guys, if you can team up, you know, after the conference or if the PTs need a physio, you guys need to be working together, just like my talk yesterday. Extremely important with ACLs, especially if someone has had an ACL reconstruction years and years and years ago and they're sort of not quite right. This is very familiar for a lot of people. They feel that at about 89%. It's not really quite right. Their hamstring's not quite right. You know, the personal trainer needs to know what exercises they need to be doing to build that person up and the specific deficits they've got, as well as the, you know, talking to the physio about what assessment, where they're at in their program. Um, and these things, the program isn't really changing that much. It's just it's how technical it gets. And as long, the, the years go on, we realise how important it is for the instruction and keeping those people on board is what makes the big results at the end of the day. Um, so for those of you who have had an ACL, you sort of know pretty much how it happened. For those of you who haven't had one, when you're thinking about the injury mechanism, remember the anti-cruciate ligament is there. Anterior means it's going from posterior to anterior, and what it does is it prevents anterior translation or forward translation of the tibia. Um, it's also, you see it's on an angle, okay? It also rotates through that knee. So it prevents anteromedial stability. So it's going to prevent movement of the tibia that way. Most people damage it that way. There's a lot of other ways of damaging it. Um, my ACL that we're going to talk about in a minute, um, that's the way I damaged it with the rotational force. Um, pretty sore. It feels like, a, well, for me, I'm a bit of a wuss, so it felt like a hot knife just went through my knee. Other people, they don't feel at all. They feel a bit of a pop. It depends on the person. Um, at the moment, there's still sort of three things going on. You've probably heard of the hamstring, heard of the patella tendon graft. Some of you, or maybe all of you, have heard of the new Lars system, which is the one I got, um, and now I'm a big advocate of that. No bias at all. Um, LARS, if you understand what LARS is, it means ligament, augmentation and reconstruction system and we'll come to the LARS in a minute with a little video about what's happening there. Um, but basically we'll talk about as we go through the sort of pros and cons of the three and you guys can make your own mind up. A lot of it comes down to what the surgeon does. So if the surgeon is very good at hamstring grafts, he'll probably try and promote that. If he's patella tendon, he'll promote that. If he's very into LARS, he'll give you all options but also give you the large option and then it's really up to the patient about what they're going to choose. So what are we going to cover? We're not going to cover too much on the physio treatment side of things. Uh, we'll touch on a little bit but again it's about how the program is split up into the six stages that we're going to go through and also what to do in each stage, what's the most important thing through each stage of those you know, as far as stretches and as far as rehab exercises and how you're going to progress those people through. And it's a very good idea, you know, people you say, oh, where am I at at this stage? Well, there's a time frame, but also a lot of people are either ahead of that time frame or, or most of the time they're behind that time frame. And the exercises, can they, or can they or can they not do those exercises? That's when you know where they're at. So you might say, oh, I'm in stage three time-wise, but I really can only do stage two exercise at the moment. So for that sort of thing, the take-home message is you need to start them at stage two and try and bring them through stage three and don't push them too quickly. Um, and it, you know, your job is trying to you know, bridge this gap between they come in for physio post-surgical and they're sore and they're swollen and it's horrible 
and get them through back to sport, there's a, a lot of changes through there. And they'll quickly, they'll do all the physio and then there's a sort of tipping point around about stage three where they sort of drift off the physio a little bit because the physio's not giving them enough exercises to do or they're not pushing them hard enough or they're not getting a relationship good enough with the client, they're not keeping them on board and, and explaining how important it is. But also that person might want to go back to that personal trainer they used to be training with before their entry a cruciate problem. So they sort of want to slip back, can I do training? Can I, can I do some, some training stuff? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they end up doing only training, conventional training, and forgetting about all their rehab that they were doing. And then they realize why, why I can't run or why is my knee sore. So you guys got to work together and you always got to have goals and aims for each stage to get them there. And they're also their prime or their end goal, you know, what do they want to do? For me, I busted my knee skiing, so I needed to go back to skiing. I had a year to get back to the season again because I wasn't going overseas. I was just doing the season in New Zealand. So I thought, right, I've got a year to get my knee absolutely perfect because I don't want to miss out on a season. And that goal, and I'll go through it in a minute, but that goal was so important to drive you. Otherwise, you get your knee good enough and you're walking around and everything feels good. You can go for a few little jogs. But what really is testing it for me is my skiing. I'm not going to be able to ski for a year, so I have sort of no idea how it's going to perform. So I have to replicate all my activities of skiing on land-based and try and push myself to try and get, you know, test myself, test myself, test myself, and all that testing is my exercise and bring myself so I know when I go skiing, I'm absolutely perfectly confident. So 100%, or sometimes you can't get to 100% due to things like hamstring and patellagrass because you are sacrificing a few body tissues with and depending on if you've had bad meniscal damage or cartilage damage when you tear your ACL or if you've done it before and you might have had a, you know, a knee injury 10 years ago and now you've got an ACL injury on top of that, you may find that getting that knee to 100% is a little bit difficult and I'll talk about what the knee does feel like you know, even a year and a half down the track. Um, but 100% meaning 100% to be able to do what you want to do. Okay, it may not feel 100% all the time, but can you ski at 100%? You know, can you play rugby? That sort of thing. That's what you're after. Right. So when you tear your anterior cruciate ligament, first thing you go in for is a test. Usually the physio does it. If you're straight in the physio clinic, acute, and they'll test it, and they go, yep, that's gone. Um, for my one, what happened, I was skiing and being 35, thinking I was 15, um, we all decided that we could do 360s and learn how to do 360s off a cat track. Instead of just doing 360s off a jump, can you do it off a cat track? Everyone knows what a cat track is. We, we're, this is where it snakes down the mountain and everyone just sort of skis down. Well, people like us want to just ski off it. So we'll ski off it into the, into the soft stuff. You think oh, soft landing, no problems. Not realising how deep that soft landing is. So when you come off the catch track one way, spinning around and landing, now for me, which way was I doing it that way? So when I landed, my ski stayed that way, okay? So I ro over rotated with one ski and my body went that way. So I landed from a massive height on my leg and just went crack like that. And when you first do it, when I first did it, it's like, I was just screaming in pain and everyone thought I was a big wuss. They go, come on, you big wuss, you know, because you just don't think that you, when you do it, it's like, yeah, that's like sore than I've ever hurt my knee before. But you never think, and especially as a physio, that you actually did it. So, and then it just puffed up a bit balloon. I felt sick, I was nauseous, you know. But actually then I sort of got up, calmed myself down and could ski down. And I go, well, that's not too bad. I kind of, you know, ski down. I was a bit sort of nervous. And then I sort of just started crashing out, going green and, Luckily, on the ski field, there's a physio uh, medical clinic and went there, and they just tested it and said, yeah, it's gone. So, and I drove home from the mountain. Yeah, it's fine. A few Panadol, it's all right. Got into the physio the next day. He said, yeah, it's gone. I still didn't believe him. And you go in for a scan, and can you see this here? Here's my anterior cruciate. Look, there's the mesomabatella. Here's the front of the knee, front of the tibia. Here's the attachment here. Can you see this mushy point? Here, where it sort of just disappears. Now, remember on an MRI scan, you're just seeing signal responses, so you can't actually see the actual physical thing. There's a complete gap there. 
It looks like there's something in between. There's nothing in between. Okay, it's just swelling and fluid and blood. Now, the good thing about this is, and that's my knee, and the good thing about that, and this is all swelling and problems are going around here. Good thing about this is, can you see how it's beautifully just sitting there? Okay, very lucky. But the problem with antiocretions and why they need to be reconstructed is that's in fluid. So it's sitting there like that now, but over time, if I leave that for sort of a few more weeks, it'll start sort of doing this and then shriveling up. So, and there's been, I think, one recorded study where it's actually joined back together, but, you know, 90, 99% of the time, that doesn't heal together like your ankle ligament because it's inside a knee and it's inside fluid, all right? It's not on the outside of your body where it can just find its way back together and ravel back together and, and, and heal up and scar up. These ones don't, so they usually have to take them out. So what normally they do is drill in through there, take that out, take a, if it's a hamstring, they'll take a graft of your hamstring, semitendinosus and your gracilis, and so they come out like two little noodles, bound them up and drill them through your knee, screw it in each end, and away you go. And you've got a new ligament. And we talk about what happens with the hamstring. The patella tendon, they'll take a bony block section out of your front of your patella tendon, take that whole bit of tendon out, sew your tendon together, and then drill that through. So you've got two bones at the end, a little bit stronger, but pros and cons again. The last system puts the synthetic fibre through and keeps your ACL. So what they do, and I'll show you in a video, is they go through through the existing, what we call a stump, okay, stump of the ACL, through that ACL, through the other stump, so they've connected the two together so they can hold statically like that. And it's like a vine on some lattice work. So the vine regrows. Because the only way it's not regrowing is because it's flapping around in the breeze doing this. If you don't have anything to hold together. So they've got a lattice work to hold it together and then it can regrow through that and they sew it into that large system. Now, the graphic I'm going to show you is, it's a graphic, so it's not really what happens. And, and if I showed you a, a video of keyhole surgery, it's all a bit of a mess and you sort of go, what is going on there? That looks just weird. So I'll give you a representation of it, of what's happening. And thanks to YouTube, I've stolen this. So here's a, you can see that all right? Yep. Here's a little representation of what's going on. So the last ligament is a synthetic fibre that looks like a horse's tail that's been braided at either, each end. So in the middle, it's like there's 100 strand fibre horse's tail. So the, 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 the t living tissue can blend through it. Of course, they have to do all your drill holes, get the guidance perfectly right. The good thing about this is they know exactly where, to, where the footbed is of the ligament because they're going through it. So all your angles are going to be really perfect. You know, they don't have too much guesswork going on. Um, and the good thing about the Lars ligament is it's about five times the tensile strength of a normal ACL. So you're not really going to bust that again unless you sort of get hit by a bus. Um, so great for people returning back to sport because they've got, they know they've got a very strong ligament going. So, so yeah, it's going through that existing stump there. Now this is a bit of a graphic. It doesn't really just pull it together like that. They, they hook it on, hook it on, and it grows. Um, but that's sort of the gist of it. So it's keeping your own tissues. And remember, if you've got your own ligament there, you've got the little receptor fibers telling the brain about position and sense. So it's a lot easier to rehab. It's a lot stronger. And the only complication about this is, will your body reject that synthetic fiber and you, will you get synovitis? And that was the big scary thing. And not too much research has been done yet. So it's one of those things where, you know, you're a bit of a guinea pig for a while. But, you know, what, worst case scenario, Okay, so it doesn't work for you. It might be one in a thousand, one in two thousand that you get a reaction to, and you have to go and get your hamstring done anyway. Well, you know, so be it. You would have got your hamstring done anyway. So that's uh, that's in a nutshell just of what's going on. Um, I got that done at St Vincent's um, under the care of, of the lovely Simon Tan. Um, if you ever need a surgeon that you want to. Um, use, I highly recommend him, um, and his surgery is immaculate. But uh, which type of surgery? Well, it's up to you. He offered me hamstring, he offered me patella, and I went for the last. So, you know, you, you choose what my research and I 
you know, that's what I wanted because I didn't want to sacrifice my hamstring, didn't want to sacrifice my patella tendon, so, and I, I took the jump and went for it and I haven't looked back. Um, brace, not these days. You see people walking around with a brace like this. Again, it does depend on the surgeon. These surgeons now want to get you moving straight away and we'll talk about how quickly you've got to get moving. So, when you're rehabbing these people, either from, you know, very early on, if you've had a client that's just busted their knee, they've gone through an ACL operation, you know you're going to be training them down the track. You've got to understand what's going on. You've got to talk to your physio. Physios need to know if they haven't seen many of these ACLs before, they need to know what is going on, get reminded about, you know, what they need to get back, what they need to restore. So for these sort of people, you've got to be thinking, when they lose, they lose their anteromedial instability, when they tear their anti-cruciate ligament, so they've got to get back their stability. Uh, the pain inhibition is one of the biggest factors. So as soon as you tear your anti-cruciate ligament, or as soon as you're going for surgery, your VMO, which a lot of you know all about, just disappears into this mush land, and it just doesn't refire for a long period of time. It just turns to just this pulp. You know, you might have had this great quads going on, and all of a sudden you've got this rubbish leg. And Remember, the VMO is so important for your stability of your leg and your control of your leg. That's got to come back. Your glutes start turning off as well. Your core starts going. So again, there's a whole complex system that you need to think about, not just, oh, I need to get their knee right. It's a lot of other things going on. And if, if you focus on the proximal segments and using their glutes, you'll get the knee right. Um, Post-surgical pain, these guys, are, girls, are going to be in massive amounts of pain. They're on morphine in hospital. They'll go into endone just because the surgery and the swelling is, you know, it's really painful. Drilling into bone and, and cutting through bone and putting things in, it is it's super sore. Um, and it's very, very stiff and tight. You know, they, they come out of surgery and you go, why did I do that? This is horrific, you know. How can this be right? And it is very hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's swollen, it's like having trauma to your knee, and if you've had your hamstring graft, remember you've got surgery to hamstring or surgery to patella, which adds into the complication. Again, this is why LARS patients tend to accelerate more quickly. You hear about footy players and, and professional athletes have had LARS getting back so quickly, you're going, oh my God, what's going on? And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is because they don't lose any body tissue, so their repair time is more quick. Um, they're stronger, they don't have um, the likelihood of re-tearing it during those sort of nine-week stage, which we'll talk about. Okay, so what are you going to do? Again, you've got to think, how do I reverse all these effects? I mean, they've had the surgery, so they've got the reverse of the, the, the injury, but again, that has to heal, and they have to retrain themselves. So their range of movement is so important. We'll talk about each stage, how much range of movement you need at each stage. Range of movement is key. Okay, if you don't get extension in the first two weeks, you are going to struggle. So having the knee being able to extend, and the surgeons will talk about the most important thing right now is for you to get your knee straight. I don't care how sore it is to get it straight, you have to get your knee straight. Because you're not going to do any damage to the knee. The damage has already been done, and it's been repaired, but it just feels so sore, you're thinking, oh, am I really supposed to do this? Range of boots are key. Um, again, the physio's job is to get that swelling down, get that pain down, soft tissue massage, icing it, making sure they're, you know, they've, they've got the right medications from the chemist, they talk to their pharmacist, they talk to their doctor, keeping them under control, um, making sure they rest, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then once you've got those things on board, they start to start working on some muscle activation. Remember, if you can't get your knee straight and the swelling, there's too much swelling, you're never going to get those muscles to fire. And you do do a lot of these things at the same time, but this is in a relative order of importance. Muscle activation, then working, you know, while they're getting their knee and they can't do much, work on their core. You know, get them, if they've had bad core and then they go and injure their knee, well, you can start working on their core and getting that up to speed so when they start doing one-legged work, they've got all this system organised. They can start working on some endurance work. Their breathing's out, their glutes not working. They need to be focusing on that while they're sitting down watching telly. Um, then work on their postural stuff. Maybe if you looked at my um, lecture yesterday, if they're hyperlordotic, what are you going to do about that? Okay, get their posture better, um, and then start working on motor control, relearning how to stand on one leg, how to bend on one leg, getting their confidence back. You know, if they've had a hamstring gaff, they won't get too many messages 
through the anterior cruciate ligament because they don't have an anterior cruciate ligament. They've got a hamstring graft. So they don't have those nice little receptors telling the brain where my knee is. They'll find that they've just lost all their balance. Then working on strength and muscle bulk. Okay, then building up their muscles that have atrophied, then building up their strength, um, moving towards impact later down the track, getting lots of stability endurance, being able to stand on one leg like Annalise is doing yesterday, um, trying to get you know, things working for a long period of time. You know, if I'm a skier and it takes me four, four or five minutes to do a run, I've got to hold my positions for four or five minutes, you know. So there's it's trying to relate what you're doing in the gym to what they're going to be doing in the sport, you know, that's just got to be that transition. Um, and also looking on their time frames, okay, making sure they stick to their time frames, making sure you educate them on what's coming up, because you might be doing these, oh, you're doing leg press, and then realise, oh my goodness, we've got to jump on a BOSU next week. So, you know, they need to be on board. If they're going away on a holiday, they need to be doing their exercise on a holiday. Otherwise, they're just going to fall behind. They're going to miss their goals. They're going to start giving up a little bit. Physio isn't working. Rehab isn't working. Yeah, sound familiar? Um, and then the final goal, returning to sport, that big jump from being in the gym and running around and doing a few Ks to can I sidestep in rugby? Have I got the confidence? Can I play you know, other sports? Um, and again, bringing you guys together, getting that little gap that we all talk about between physio or exercise phys and, and, and PT. So when you're doing these, when you look at the stage one to six, think about that sort of stuff, okay, and you realise what you need to do in each one. So stage one, so this is the weeks one to two. So they need to be seeing the physio within that first week. Most surgeons say you've got to go see the physio. You'll get a few hospital exercises to do for just a little bit of um, home education, and then I would suggest they get straight into to see the physio. Again, zero degrees extension, the most important thing. Don't try and bend the knee. They won't want to extend because it hurts. They'll feel like they want to keep their knee bent all the time. All right? But you've got to have it, get it straight. It's the most important goal. How many times? Every hour, every half hour, pushing it straight, pushing it straight. They'll feel like they can't do it. The physio will help them with that. Um, but, of course, if you get more swelling down, then you'll be able to get it straighter. Okay? So taking your meds that you need to take, uh, making sure you're getting your massage. Ice, ice, I'll put it down there, is your friend. It is the most wonderful thing for your knee when you've had an anterior cruciate reconstruction because the icing, one, helps your, sw your swelling, but it's a pain reliever because a lot of people have, they'll take endone and they'll take it for a few days and they'll be blocked up and they'll go, oh, I don't really like that stuff, it's giving me nightmares. So they go down to Panadol and they go, oh my God, that Panadol's just not enough. So, but the icing completely sort of blocks out the pain and they'll find it's your friend. And if you get one of these, what we sell in the clinic, these wrap packs where they have ice packs that can move around inside and then you wrap them up. And, you know, when they're at home, because they're going to be off for two weeks, I suggest being off for two weeks' work. Ice it every single day, two or three times a day. And they've just got to be told to do it. And once they start doing it, they're going, God, that's, thank you so much for telling me. That is awesome. And they just find time to do their stretches, find time to do their exercises. But if they're in pain all the time, they're not going to do them. So if you use the ice, that'll calm them down. They'll be able to straighten that leg out a little bit more. They'll be more likely and more confident to do the homework. Um, the physio stuff, you can use some KT tapings, kinesio taping, help reduce the, the fluid, help activate muscles. Um, very good stuff early on to use that. Um, local treatment, acupuncture, compression, rest is massive. And, you know, trying to work on your stretching. Now, the stretching they need to work on is bending and straightening the knee. Okay, so they've got their extension. They want to be, you know, sitting in there watching Fox Sports or whatever they're doing and just pushing that knee straight as hard as they can until they can't tolerate it anymore and then trying to bend it up and then pushing it down and just doing as many of those as they can tolerate per hour. And the more they free it up, the better. Um, prone extension is this one here because a lot of time, when, they, sorry, when they're doing that, they get to the point they just go, I just, oh, I just can't do it because their cord's not working. They try and use their hamstring, they try and use the glutes, this, this won't go down. Sometimes they have to get a little bit of gravity being on the edge of a bed or something and just trying to just let the gravity straighten that out. And they might want to get their leg on there and just 
push it a little bit straighter. That sort of thing. You know, to help with that, chest, you know, they need to be doing calf stretches. Their calf will be so tied up through the back there. Hamstring stretches, but if they've had a hamstring graft, they need to back off that in the first two weeks. Make sure you write that down. Okay, you don't want to be stretching out a hamstring that's just had its tendon taken out. Okay, it needs to heal. So, again, that's why those hamstring people will be a little bit delayed. Yep, very important. So, second part of that, stage one, what are you going to work on the strength? So, once they've stretched all that out, we've got to get these things firing. And VMO squeezes. So, this is the one where if they can get their VMO firing when they've been doing their flexion extension, they get down and, and try and squeeze and fire that quad up. Okay? If they get really good and they've got extension, they've got enough quad, they can then start doing straightening raises. But they're not allowed to do it if they can't straighten their knee. If their knee's like that and they try and then do a raise, what do you think the tibia is going to do on that graft? Okay, it's too much load. Right? Especially if they've had a patella tendon or a hamstring graft and that's, it's very weak in there and they try and do that, it's going to be too much load. So they have to actually get extension before they lift. Okay. Um, prone holes we talked about before. Prone glutes I did yesterday. So they can, you know, they're not really sort of moving around the house. So they get back on the floor. They need to start working on how to talk to their glutes a little bit more. Okay. Tilting back, getting their buttock going, trying to raise their leg without losing their core stability. They've got to get working on that. Um, heel pushes. So if they're sitting in a chair, I haven't got a chair, but if you, all you people sitting down at the moment, if you put your hand under your buttock for me, say your right one, sit in neutral, of course, and I want you to slowly ram your heel down as though you're pushing your heel through the floor. Can you feel your buttock kicking in? Okay, and if your buttock's a bit lazy, clench your buttock at the same time so you're telling your brain, when I push my heel down, I want my buttock firing. So when they're walking, it's going to start firing. So that's the thing they can do while they're sitting down, watching TV, while they're sitting down at the dinner table, whatever. Um, very important. Calf raises they can start working on if they can keep their knee straight. A lot of the time they've got their knee bent and they, and they can't calf raise. They've got to be able to have their knee straight before they can calf raise. Um, the only proposition at this stage is just learning how to go from here to there. And some people find it very difficult, but you've got to push it. Because if they're going to walk, if they can't balance well on one leg and they're doing this sort of thing, then they're going to start doing this when they walk. Okay, so they've got to get learning how to balance on one leg. And bike is the other thing you need to must get them straight on. You know, you can't, don't be afraid of this little one. You're not running around and sidestepping. The surgeons and, and all the physios say, you've got to get this thing moving. And they go, but it's sore. I said, no, we don't care. You've got to get this moving. It will get less sore the more you move it. The reason it's sore is because you're not moving it. So it is a very much an education thing. And you'll find that they get on a bike, the best thing to do is get on a recumbent bike, and they can go, oh, they can't get around, so they have to go back. And, then, oh, and they might spend three or four days, or maybe even a week, until they actually get enough flexion to get around. Very important though when on the bike, you know, you've, again, you've got to educate them. So they get around and they'll stay bent all the time. You've got to get them straight and bent. Straight and bent. So the, the little bend and straightenings they're doing on the floor, you know, three sets of ten they can tolerate in the first week. Can you imagine if they did 5,000 revolutions on a bike, how many straightenings they're going to be doing? They've got a lot more benefit from, if they can get on a bike, this is your bending and straightening now. Okay, this is your bending and straightening. Doing that and bending and that and bending, that and bending. You know, 60 revolutions a minute. How many are you going to go and do? Okay, they might tolerate 10 minutes, they might tolerate 5 minutes, building up to 15, that sort of thing as the weeks go on. Does that all make sense to you guys? Yep. They'll pull up, yeah, exactly. And, you, and you, your responsibility is to educate them to like push that heel down into the floor. Yeah, you know, the same as you did with the heel push, that feeling. You know, if you teach them that, they go, oh, right, yeah, heel push, yep, heel push. And then they'll do a few and then they'll go back to bending. No, straighten it. You know, you have to be with them doing it. Do's and don'ts. So you've got to rest. These people have got to get off work, okay? You can't say, oh, can I come back to work after a week? No. Because what's going to happen is they won't do their homework and then they'll be delayed and they'll be sore. And then because they're going to be sore, they won't do their homework. Yeah, so 
ice packs, get into it. Extension is the most important. You've got to repeat these exercises as many times a day as they can tolerate. And then at night, you've got to sleep. And they may need a pillow to rest. They may need ice at night. They'll be up. You know, they won't sleep very well. Remember, if you're not sleeping very well, you won't heal very well. Okay, so they've got to take their meds. But again, you know, we're trying to push these people. We don't push them too hard. Some people we get in the clinic are a little bit gung ho. And they so when can I run? When can I run? Hang on, mate. We just, you know, you just got to get your knee straight. So those some people we actually have to pull the reins in a little bit because they think they're better than they are. And a lot of the people that we get, they will get to the stage where they can get around and walk. Oh yeah, I'll be right. Don't need to do much rehab. I'll go for a bit of a jog. And they are at the time frame where they can jog, but and you'll see in these exercises, the exercises test them as well as get them better. So we bring them down to size of it. Okay, let's do this exercise. They go, oh, it's so hard. Oh, why is it so hard? See, we've got to be able to pass that before you go and jogging. Because otherwise they'll go jogging and they're, they're going to get patellofemoral problems, they're going to get other issues because they haven't got their muscle system up to speed. Um, and just in this first two weeks, just limit their walking and standing. Just try and stop them doing too much. And if they've got a limp, they need crutches. The reason for that is you're trying not to get that limp pattern in their brain. You're trying to get rid of that. So if they're too sore, get the crutches. Every time they go from the couch to the bench, they can't you know, do this because then they're going to go out, the, out to the car like this. They're going to be like that. If you can get the crutches in and start you know, walking normally, then they're more likely to keep that good pattern going. Okay, so... Stage one done, five to go. Stage two, two to four, okay? Now, they have to, again, keep that extension, that promotion of extension. But now, we need to go up to 130 degrees flexion. So all of a sudden, we've got to get them from here, which they were there, now we've got to get them up to here in the next two weeks. All right, so things, that, you know, the pressure's on. They have to get this being firing. If, they have, if it's still mushy, you haven't done your job, or they haven't done their job. There's no real excuse. You should have it firing by now. And so you've got to, if that's not firing, you think, geez, that's a massive goal. I've really got to work hard on that. I've got to tell them they've got to you know, work hard on that. And then some people might have been away on a business trip at this point because they had to. Oh, I haven't done my exercise yet. No. Well, you know, let's, let's pick up the pace. Um, physio, really as per week one, you've sort of keep going with all the local treatment, helping these people you know, you're trying to give them an environment in which they can do their homework. The biggest thing that makes them better is their homework. You're just guiding them through it. Um, you're now getting the soft tissue scar massage because their stitches come out at 10 days. So they'll be back to the surgeon. So you've got to show the surgeon you've done a pretty good job. So the stitches come out, then they can start getting into the pool and that sort of thing. And they'll have all their bandages off, as in the little, the little, little bandages. Um, and you start getting their scar tissues. Remember, they've got two portals in the front, so one where the camera's gone in, one where the cutting machine's gone in, and the hooks and all the things they use. You've got a drainage portal up the top, and you've got a drill hole down the bottom. And the most, of the, the two top ones, they're not too bad. It's these ones that go through the fat pad in the front of the knee, they're the ones that they feel, oh, that feels a bit gross. And they've got to get loosened up, because otherwise, they're just not going to get this sort of range. Okay? Loosening up their patella, ITB, rolling their ITB, all that sort of stuff. Okay, they've really just got to get looser and looser and looser and looser and looser. Um, stretches come down to one, two times a day because they're probably going back to work now. All right, so they just haven't got as much time, but it's not as essential because they should have their zero degrees extension anyway. They should have their VMO firing, so it's less needing to stretch. They've worked on it for two weeks, they're getting better, but they still have to focus on it. Okay. Uh, and you start stretching their quads out. Because before they could only get to here, they're not really stretching their quads. If they can get higher, they need to start stretching their quads out. If you can stretch their quads out more, you're going to get, the knee's just going to feel better. When their quads are really tight, you're going to get heaps of patellofemoral pain. So they need to you know, start getting into here. Oh, God, it's so tight. You know, and start stretching it out. They'll do three sets of that. They'll go, oh, that feels better. And then half an hour later, it's all tight again. So they have to keep working on it. Um, Using that foam roller. Glutes, the glutes are going to be super tight. If something's inactive, it's going to be super tight. They may have limped for two weeks. Look at their lower back, start getting tight sides loosened up. All right? Um, and what are we going to do rehab-wise? So, 
This is where we start getting into doing a few more interesting things. Glute bridges, which I showed a lot of you yesterday. The wall holds, so being able to, I don't know if I can do this, but stand on the wall. You know this old one you used to do at primary school? How long can you hold it for? It's so important. Okay, they're probably fine. Oh, 10 seconds, I've got to get up. Okay, they just haven't got the endurance. The loading through the joint is just too hard. They've got to build up that to a minute. They've got to at least hold that for a minute because that's probably how long you're going to be doing squats for. So if you can do a static hold for a minute, you'll be able to do squats. Okay, so working on that. Isometric hamstrings, isometric meaning not moving. So they've got to be able to hold and do that and hold it there. And that seems easy for you guys. It's very hard when you've had a hamstring graft and it's very hard when your knee's super tight. It's like resistance. Okay? But we don't be doing this because we've got a fresh new ACL surgery and we've got a hamstring, if they have had a hamstring um, graft. So you don't be doing step, you know, open chain work like this just yet. You've got to work on the isometric stuff first. Body weight squats, just working on this. Throughout those two weeks, if they're pretty good, put a band around their legs to make their glutes fire up a little bit more and the hip stabilizers. Get on a BOSU as they get better. So their proprioceptive feedback is like, oh, that's, you know, they need that sort of feedback. Remember, a lot of these people, their balance is shot not because it's shot in their brain, it's because they're not getting their messages from their knee as well as they used to. And that's fine, so they just get there, like, oh, it's not working on getting their balance right, start, you know, using the band, that sort of works great. And that's hard enough for them. They'll get to the point where they go, oh, I can't go any further than that because they haven't got the strength. Right? And remind them it's not because of the surgery, it's because of, you know, there's nothing wrong with your knee anymore. Well, apart from the weakness, it's the strength that you've lost. Um, Patter kicks and deadlifts and leg press. Leg press, you've got to be very careful that you don't want to load them up. If they, you can load them up if they've got a Lars. Okay, you can do a single leg press, which I'll show you in a minute, but you just got to watch. You, know, you have to have their glutes going first. Otherwise, this sort of thing happens. This isn't just me showing, showing what's going on. Their knee rolls in. If you're going to do that, they're going to start stressing their anterior cruciate ligament. They're going to get knee pain. So you've got to really focus on teaching them how they're going to hold that knee. So their glutes have to be working first, keeping that knee beautifully in line and driving through and using their buttock. Okay, so education on that machine. And the lightest weight possible. You know, don't be afraid of getting on a leg press at week three, as long as it's light. Okay, there's no difference in doing this. Okay. But try and use a closed chain machine like that. You know, you've seen leg presses where you push away, an open chain machine. You need to try and focus on a closed chain machine if you can. Um, deadlifts and paddock kicks are for the hamstrings. Now, if you've had a hamstring graft, you want to avoid that at this point. So just working on getting them doing deadlifts. Their knee's pretty static. It's going to be pretty fine. They need that hamstring strength back. As down the track, the hamstring gets better. They've had a hamstring graft. You can start working on it. But why are you working on hamstrings? Not just because they've had a graft. Why else would you work on a hamstring? Does anyone know? Yeah, it helps the anterior cruciate ligament. So when I kick a ball, my hamstring is controlling that movement. Okay, so it's assisting my anti cruciate that is repairing. So I need heaps of strength there to make sure that my knee operates perfectly. It's not just about the quads. Proprioception, you need to be balancing on one leg now. So we were doing squats on a BOSU. All right, so we can do, because that's two-legged, so we share the load, that's nice and fine. But for one-legged, they're just not going to have the strength at this stage to be able to do that. And most people get on this BOSU and do this. You imagine what that's going to do to your knee after a few minutes of that. So they've got to make sure that you can actually balance, put that leg down, hold it. Can they balance there? How long can they do it for? 30 seconds, a minute. Put it down again. Okay. Left and right leg. Doing the other leg to tell the brain, this is how I do it. So you can recruit muscle padding for the injured leg. Hammy drops is this one. Okay. Learning how they'll, they'll, they'll drop their leg and misfire. Go, oh, God, you know. So they've got to go from there. Can you drop your leg and stop it and get good at their timing? Because their timing will be completely out. They just won't, because the, the tightness, the message is going on here. 
It's so important for hamstring eccentric training when you're going to run to get their foot in the right position, especially with sport. So you start learning that early. There's not much load going on. It's more about proprioceptive work. Um, cardio, so now they're on the bike. There should be full revolutions. And now they get into the rower. Now the rower is awesome for, again, your bending and straightening. Because all this exercise, they'll still tighten up and they'll still struggle with trying to get their knees straight again. So you can imagine if you're doing 30 revolutions per minute on a rower, which is pretty easy, yeah? How many of those are they going to do in five minutes? Yeah? 150. Would you do 150 in five minutes at home? Probably not. So, and they don't sort of realise that, you know, what you're trying to do is get them bending and straightening a knee and getting their quads and glutes going, but they think, oh, I'm just getting some fitness back. But as long as you educate them on when they row, they've got to straighten their knee and, and bend it. you just got to be careful how far they bend. Okay, they don't want to go too far. Remember, our goal was 130. Don't go over that. Um, and get them in the pool. Use the pool like a recovery. Because if you do bike and row every day, they're going to start getting sore. And the weightlessness of the pool really helps them sort of learn how to do you know, hard tasks on land, but easy in the water. Okay, so they can start sort of walking through the pool. You see this on every Sunday morning on the footy show. You know, people, you know, the footy players getting in the pool and recovering. No, not really any different. Okay, you've had a big session in the day with the bike and all your rehab, recover in the pool. People just don't do it. Yep. Oh, the chlorine, whatever. I don't care. Get in the pool because it's going to make you so much better the next day. Do's and don'ts for this section. Got to push that extension during exercise. We started with extension, just trying to get extension. Now get it during exercise so you get some quads going. Okay? These people get bored at this stage. They haven't got time. I'm back to work. Oh, I'm missing a physio session. Yeah, it's not too bad. I can walk. You know, it's feeling all right. They haven't, they haven't gone through the real exercise yet, so they don't really know that their knee is not up to scratch. And they start getting bored with your rehab. So you've got to motivate the heck out of them. And it's very hard to not sort of... You're very tempted to give them harder exercises because you want to keep them motivated, and that's the very hard part. So whatever you can do to keep them on board without pushing them too hard. You know, if I start getting someone doing this sort of thing, they're going to go, well, now my knee's like really sore and I have to lie in bed for a day. So it, it is a very difficult time, and if you can coach them through it, saying we will get to harder exercises in a couple of weeks, you've just got to hang in there. Um, and that's a lot about you telling them how important it is at this stage. Get their VMO going. Watch the even weight bearing, making sure when they squat they're not drifting off to one side. Um, and just be careful of this pain in the front. So, is everyone okay so far? Any questions about stage two? You good, yeah? Pull exercises, keep going. Pull exercises, start off, just don't, I should have elaborated on that. Start off walking through the pool, okay? They can then try and do a little bit of lunging, not full lunging, because we haven't even taught them that yet. So they can just start sort of, you know, learning how to bend their knee. They'll find it's weight, it's easy. But the quicker they go, the harder it is on their quads. Okay, so that's their resistance. Right? They can start doing a little bit of this, but, you know, they may like to do that. And the, the movement of the water with that lateral movement, they go, oh, I don't really sort of like that. Okay, so they might do this sort of thing. But it's just keeping their body moving, Yeah on a day after they've done some heavy exercise. Because you probably find they do some, you know, some bike and all their work and, God, you know, felt really good. They get up the next day and go, oh, my leg is so stiff. The last thing you want to do is go for a walk and do more bike. So if they can get to the pool, they'll find it frees up, the swelling goes down, they get a little bit better. And the pool does turn into, you know, if you want to stick with the pool, running through the pool later on, they might do some swimming, that sort of thing. But make sure you don't get them swimming. If you say, do some pool work, they go away and do some kicking, they're just going to wreck their knee. It's going to be horrific. So try that, that sheer forcing. Try and avoid that. So now stage three, this starts, well, I've got a, quite a few patients who are in stage three at the moment, and the pressure's on. So if you look up at the six to 12, that's for a hamstring and patellograph. That's a rough guide. You see the Lars. All right. And the reason for that, is this nine-week thing? Sorry, that's not really working well. 
nine weeks, at nine weeks, that hamstring or patella tendon, remember, they take the living tissue out. As soon as they put it on the surgical table, it starts dying. So when it goes into the tissue, it's dead tissue. It's your tissue, so the body doesn't react and try and eat it up. Okay? But it's dead tissue. And by nine weeks, it's at its weakest point. So when it goes in, it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And you don't know that. You think you're getting better and better and better. But the actual ligament is so, so weak in there. So if they start doing hard stuff, or they start going for a little bit of a jog because they think they can, and they haven't got enough stability, and they step on a rock and do that, they'll go and tear their anterior cruciate, their new one. All right? And there's stories of that happening. They've gone out too early, people just gone kaboom. Or they've stretched it, and now it's all loose, and they've lost their, their anteromedial stability again, and they have to go and get it redone. Horrific. So that's why the Lars, oh, it's nice, it's hard as a rock, you know? So all they have to focus on is their muscles and getting the running down, and away we go. And, you know, surgeons promote, you know, weight-bearing and getting things going to build the bone strength up where they've drilled the holes in. They need to build that bone strength up, just like people who have been in space need the weight bear to get their bone mineral density back up. So, you know, you've got to make sure that um, you're, you're sticking to the guidelines. And four to six weeks, you know, you have to push these people, and you're fine, you can push these people, and they respond really well. But watch those people who are hamstring and patella. Um, so we're really trying to get these people into their rehab now. We're, we're setting out how many times a week you're doing like this, and you've got to come in three times a week or come in twice a week, whatever they're doing. They've got to have homework exercises they do. They've got to have gym exercises they do. They've got to have cardio exercises they do. Um, and, you know, start getting their hamstrings. If you probably find that people have hamstring grafts. You can start loosening up their hamstrings, which frees them up a little bit more. Um, Stretch is probably down to once a day due to time restraints, but also they don't need to do as much. Child suppose they need to start just getting in here and start getting that knee bent like this. I probably find they can only go a certain way because they doing they can't sort of do it this way. They, they, they get to there and they can't get it, so they need some extra force to get their knee a little bit more bent. All right, and this is the juicy stuff. So they start doing physio lunges. Now, the first time they'll start doing them, and remember, not normal lunges, because normal lunges are going to provide too much shear forces, so I'll do it this way. If I do a normal lunge, too much shear force going through my knee, I really want to get a compressive force in the front of the knee and keeping the weight down again through my heel, because I've practiced pushing my heel down and firing my glute and got my glute better and everything's a little bit better. I've practiced my hamstring work. I've practiced my quad work. So now I do a complex movement, Everything should start working, and I can build up my endurance and my real strength through there. But again, no weights with this yet. Um, physio lunges are so important, so important. And no, no traveling lunges, nothing like that, just physio lunges. One leg step downs. Again, this is hard. They'll, they'll get onto that leg, and they'll get to about here, and they'll just, geez, I can't go any further than that. So don't push them. They've got to work in the available range they've got. So they work on that range get to about there, and then they have to push up and making sure they fire all the right muscles. Get that buttock going. Okay, and as they get better, and they might start rolling in, as they get better, they've got to get all the way down. And I don't mean, don't try and do these ones. Okay, it's just going to kill them in the front of the knee. You've got to step back to engage more hip flexion, more buttock control. Hamstring curls, so I showed you this yesterday. Again, you've got to work on their core as well as their hamstring curls. Uh, this one is a bad hamstring curl because I'm arching my back too much and I've got my feet in plantar flexion. So that's bad, bad. So you've got to make sure you keep your spine in neutral and just work the hamstring. Keep your feet in dorsiflexion. Okay, so that's two hamstring curls. Once you pro and then you progress to eccentric. So you're coming up. And then take away the good leg. And that's a lot harder than you think when you've had a hamstring graft. So you've got to be careful with that. Sometimes those machines are too heavy. Start using bands. You can get them on the same machine, hook some bands around their legs, some light bands. It's a lot easier to do. All right? If they're on, if they've progressed well on their one leg step down and you want to fire them up a little bit more, use a band. Okay? Gets their, keeps their control a little better. Or if they're struggling with their control, 
put a little light band around so they can fight against it and they learn where to go. Swiss ball curls are great. Okay, work on those. Be careful of overload. Single leg deadlifts, awesome stuff. Okay, start working on those. So your strength rehab program, that's what you start including now. That's what you focus on. All right? Um, if they start getting good, their balance that they were doing on the BOSU of one leg, they were doing this, remember? They don't need to do this anymore because if they can step down, now they start learning how to step down on a BOSU. So they might go all the way on that. They might go, oh, half the way. They start shaking away, and they get good and good and good at that. They may start doing single deadlifts on this. So they start working on you know, having a bar. Can I balance on one leg? Very important for a lot of sport to be able to do that. Okay? Um, both who size it, when they start progressing, they get up to maybe about, what week are we? Remind me. Six to 12, so about week five, six, or about week 10. Week 10. It's a long time, isn't it? I remember watching Biggest Lose, and they're up to week 10, and they're sailing, you know, and they think, this has been going on for ages, and it's only been 10 weeks. So they'll feel like it's been going on for ages. Um, but sidestepping. Okay, so not impact yet, though. Sidestep. So getting on that BOSU. And learning how to do that. Now, when you've had a reconstruction, that's very nerve-wracking because you've got a wobbly surface. Again, for you guys, you've got to watch the instruction. When they, most people will just go, oh, yep. Have I done it? Not really. So you've got to make sure that they bend at the knee. Now, what's the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to start doing that, which is going to give them that, oh, don't like that. That's what they've got to stop having because that's how they injured their knee. Bang! So they've got to get good at that again. And they might just start learning how to just push on and push off, push on and push off. Oh, yep, getting confident with that. And then being able to stand up and they might just step off it. The hardest part is the eccentric part. It's going from here and squatting. So think with this one, squat on and squat before you come off. Okay, and trying to keep your weight and your knee all in line. Don't let the knee roll in. Very important stuff to do. Um, lateral step-ups. So... Getting that was just a bosu. Now with that one, you could probably see that my weight was on an angle. Okay, and I'm just it's a dynamic one coming on, coming off. With a box, you, a step up is a higher box. I've only got it this height at the moment, maybe a few stages higher, but it depends on the height of the person and the strength of the person. Again, what you want to work on this one is just the strength and the loading, because this is what they don't like. They don't like this lateral movement, because as soon as they got that, they've got the ability to crash in. So they want to come over, get all their body weight over that leg, and then drive up. Very hard thing to do when you've had a reconstruction, but very important thing to do. Cardio, just increase their bike. They're going to probably start loving the bike. And the problem with these people is they start loving the bike and hating everything else because the bike's easy. <laughs> Makes them feel like they're back into fitness, way we go. They hate all that other stuff. Okay? But it's very important to do the bike to get their endurance up in their quads and their glutes and all their muscle system, as well as getting their fitness better. Work on their row, work on their swim. No breaststroke. Why no breaststroke? That movement, you've got it. Okay? It stresses them out too much. And they're allowed to do short works. Finally, we can do some walking at this stage. Short walks, no jogging. People go, oh, listen, I sort of had a little bit of a jog today. Well, <laughs> we've got to stop that. I can be here, but I can. I can. I can. I sort of, sort of did a little jog. Okay, so can you do this? You know, they go, oh, no, not really. They said, well, you know, this is what you've got to work on. Because otherwise that jog is going to turn very bad for them. So stop them jogging. All right. 12 to 18. We're getting down the track now. 12 to 18. All right. They're attending physio a lot less now. They're probably coming to see me once a week, once every two weeks. They're back with the trainer. Yep. Can I do personal training? Absolutely. They probably should start training. You know, the first two weeks, they can do some upper body stuff. So they're probably back with the trainer anyway if they've got a trainer. But back training legs now. The trainer has to make sure that they know every single one of these exercises to keep their program going. Okay? So they don't miss out because there's a lot of things to get them from this point to playing sport. 
So their walking distance needs to increase, their tolerance of being able to walk. That every time they walk, they've got to practice thinking about getting all their muscles going so they stop limping. The classic thing with these people is when they, when they limp, they'll take a short step. Okay, so they've got to try and take a longer step and push through. And you've got to educate them on that. Um, just building up their muscle bulk. You know, bigger muscles and stronger muscles, they're going to absorb more impact. It's going to be better for them. Um, and then we, you know, our goals are trying to go, how do we get this person jogging? How do we get this person impacting? Because they want to go back to pump class. They want to go, or step class. They want to start doing box exercise. You know, these things they want to start doing, well, we have to create exercises and get them doing exercises so they can do that. You can't just say, oh, you're strong enough now, go do you know, a class. Because they'll do a class and they go, that's really sore. You know, oh, my strengthening didn't work. I don't know what to do. You know, you've got to educate them on those exercises first. And you know, just keep stretching, 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 stretching. So increase your weights and what you're doing. So everything that you're doing, can you put a weight on it? Can you put weight on lunges? Can you put weights on doing step downs? Can you hold a couple of dumbbells and start working on step downs on the BOSU? Right? Hamstring deadlifts, increasing the weight, getting those muscles working a little bit more. It gets a little bit more... You know, less sort of rehab and more strength training. Um, one leg step ups going forward. We were doing lateral step ups before. Okay, they're actually easier than doing from here on a big height, trying to do this movement. Okay. So again, you've got to work on the eccentric phase. So they may find they can, they can go, oh, yeah, I can do that. No worries. And they'll just go, do that. And you sort of won't know anything about it, but you've really got to work on this phase and control, not, not getting to the point where they come down and go and drop because that is a failure at that point. That's a lack, lack of strength at that point and it will muck them up somewhere down the track if they don't work on that. Sit to stand squats, so sitting in a chair, if you guys all sit, can you just do, let me do a little favour? You're going to do a sit to stand squat Okay, so put your stuff aside. What I want you to do is try and stand up with no hands. Okay, good. Now, stand on one leg and try and sit down on one leg and slow it down. <laughs> and you guys haven't had recons, or some of you. Okay, they need to work on that because that's important. Um, it's important for sport, it's important for skiing, it's important for a lot of sports. Eccentric leg extension, everyone goes, is it bad to do the leg extension? Most of the time because you're getting a lot of shearing forces. But if you've had a Lars, you can do an eccentric extension machine. So two up, very light, take one away, work on controlling that movement on the way down. Okay, but it has to be under guidance and it does depend on the person and I wouldn't give it to everybody. Right? Definitely no single leg extensions try and get the quads going because that's what they used to do. It's just not going to help them. And if they've had a patellar tendon graft, you probably get rid of that completely altogether because it's just going to be too much load through the patellar tendon. So hamstring jog kicks. There's this one. You've seen Ricky Ponning coming up on his way to the pitch, that sort of thing. Now that seems quite easy, but you try and do that for 100 metres on a hamstring that's had a graft. Okay, you need to build up that how quick that movement is because that will help them with their sprinting. If they've got one leg that's falling behind all the time, they're never going to get their speed back or they're going to tear their hamstring. So it's a strengthening tool. Um, Bosu lateral hops. So now you've progressed them. They, they're, they're doing quite well with, with their stepping on. Now they've got to try and stick the jump on the hop. So if you imagine, okay, I'm going to land about there, right. And this is a nice soft surface. So they're getting to learn how to learn on, land on a wobbly or soft surface. So, okay, where am I going to? They might start here and land. Okay, yep, can do that. And as they get better, they just get wider and wider. Okay, now soft landing wobbly, hard landing here. Okay, some people find that's easy for their cruciate ligament. They go, oh, yes, not too bad. They go on the other side where they have to land hard. And they go, this is their good leg, this is their bad leg. And they go, oh, yep. Oh, God, you know, that's really bad. So you've got to make sure that, you know, are you landing down on it or are you landing on an angle and using your muscle to control that to stop it 
going that way or, or going inwards. Okay? Closer you are to the BOSU, easier it is, more safe it is. As they get more confident, they get stronger, wider and wider and wider. That turns into, uh, oh, you got your single D lifts, one leg step up jumps. Okay, so they've got, they should have all their control back by now. They should have, their knees shouldn't be rolling in. They want to start working on lateral one leg step up jumps. So this should be a lot higher, maybe six or seven stages, depending on the height and the strength of the person. You want to start working on getting from here, doing that, okay? Making sure when I land, I didn't do that. We should cane them and make, you know, they may not feel sore at the moment. If they keep doing that for three weeks and they do that and that and that and that, they're going to start ending up with problems. So you guys have got to make sure they can do that exercise and keep their knee in alignment. Right? Side steps and grapevines. Now I've set up a little thing here. Side steps, if anyone plays touch footy or rugby or something like that, they'll know how to play, do side steps. Side stepping for this at this stage is on your toe. Now I know you guys probably can't see this, but what you're trying to aim for is some cones, that sort of thing. And when you do a side step, you know, one, two, three, side step. Okay? And it's actually not that hard for a cruciate ligament because you're on your toe and you use, you've, you've done all this work. It's not actually that difficult. It's the step and rotate, which we'll come to next, next stage, is the hard part. So stepping lateral is not too bad. But they need to work on it. In a park, 100 metres, 20 times, 10 sets, that sort of thing, depending on what their skill level is. Grapevines, you know this one. Okay, that's one way of doing it. It just builds up their confidence. The other way of doing it is standing and squatting and coming away. Okay, learning how to keep that knee and stop it rotating. So squatting like that, keeping the line and then going. Yep. Okay, so you see how our skill level is starting to get a little bit harder? And we're doing a lot of skill work and rotation and lateral work and strength work just to get these people light jogging. Yep. So there's a lot of work going in over the weeks to get them to this point. So they're still walking and then they've got to go for their first light jog, which is very nerve wracking. Yeah. I lasted about a thousand meters in my first one before I had to stop. Because I just I was worrying it's like it's like having a mechanical leg. You've sort of you've forgotten what to do. And then the second one's 1,500 metres, third one's 2,000, 2,000, 2,500, 2,500, 3,000, we get into 3 and a half Ks. It builds up over the weeks. But it does take a very long time to get up to anywhere near 10K. It just takes a long time. And it does depend on how much surgery you've had. Like I've had my last done, but also I split my meniscus in half and had to sew the whole thing back together. And I've got a lot of wear in my kneecap and all sorts of things. So if you've just had a clean ACL, you might be jogging a little bit earlier and, 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 and you can progress very quickly. Other people who've had old meniscal tears or other damage just take a little bit longer because they go for a run. They feel a little bit of sort of aching through there as the loading goes on. It's not bad. It's just they, you know, you've got to take a little bit less time. All right. Now we get into the juicy stuff. So they can jog. We're getting their running going a little bit more now. Okay, so they, they've got to stay consistent. Jogging, you know, two, week, two times a week at least. And every other day is their weights. And try and work on their program, if you can take this tip home, weights before. Weights, 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 weights. Get the muscle strength up and stretching the day, I would say Monday. Tuesday is your run day. So you've done your muscle work, Yeah. You might put some proprioceptive stuff in there as well, all the jumping and all that sort of thing, but not too heavy before the run. So when they go for a run, all the muscles are all fired up. And making sure before they go for a run, they get in the park and they're doing a few lunges and they're doing a few you know, sides and, they, and they're firing these muscles up before they go for that run. Okay? And then the next day after the run is their recovery. Now, if they have to recover a lot, they're probably in the pool. If they don't have to recover that much, they're probably on a bike and doing their upper body. So you really have to work out their program quite well. Otherwise, if you go for a run and try to do weights the next day, they go, they just won't get it right. And they haven't done weights before, so they're a little bit weak. You know, so you've got to get your timing right. Um, for a physio, we've got to sort of, at this point, we really review them. They've been in the surgeon for their last session. 
and they're going, okay, you know, your hamstring is still down, you test their hamstring, the physio might say, listen, Bob, his hamstring's still weak, you've got to, you know, really work on their hamstring strength for the next sort of two months, okay, get up to speed, okay, or well, their quad's still down, or well, their glutes, fire, their glute that they never had, they need to really fire that up, and you've got to start working harder, you're doing too much on the, the quad's great, that's awesome, okay, but the reason they're getting knee pain is because their, you know, their glutes are not good enough, okay, so it's very good to have a physio, you know, reviewing them all the time, making sure that they are, you know, getting that muscle testing done, so you're always guided on what to do, because some people are different than others. You know, it's a little bit different of how they're going to respond to the rehab. Um, jogging side steps. So we talked about side stepping. I just call them jogging side steps now. Now, this is a little bit harder because what you're doing is you're trying to land on the whole foot and do a, a knee bend. Whereas before, I don't know if you can see me, we were just landing. Okay, so we're sticking the jump. It's very much a co-contraction, bang and off. So what was happening is our land was our push-off. So it's like a spring. We practiced the spring on the BOSU, now it's on the floor. The, the, sort of the full jogging ones is what happens is you're landing and going and down. And it's a lot harder because you're going deeper into the squat, but very important for sport. Okay, so when you land, you're going one, two, three. Oh, my goodness, you know. So they've got to start light and start getting deeper and deeper and deeper so they build up the strength and their loading ability. Change direction drills, okay, so running through cones, all right, so they're trying to sort of change direction like this. So that's, oh, yeah, that's pretty easy, not too hard. Now, okay, trying to zigzag. So they face one way and they've got to change direction and go 45 degrees the other way, which is very common if you're playing a sport and you're going to dummy someone, right, that way, okay, and they might not like that too much, so they've got to slow it down. So you go to here, change direction. Learn where to plant the foot. Where's the body going? All right. If I plant my foot, I'll go up on here and do it. If I'm going this way, I want to go that way because I'm going to dummy. Okay, if I land this way and I do that, what's going to happen to my lovely anterior cruciate? That's how I injured it in the first place. All right. So I've got to learn how to land and push off before I twist. Okay, it actually takes quite a bit of skill and you've got to repeat it so many times so when they do it on the footy field or wherever they, wherever they are, it's automatic. Okay, not bang and delayed and oh, you know. Okay, skill things. This gets into the sports specific stuff that we come into in a minute. And it's, it's, if you guys don't know it, then you need to maybe talk to your sports coach or someone. Hopefully, you know, some of the times they're athletes and they know their old footy drills, they know their old netball drills, they know what to do in tennis, and you can start using that as your rehab and practicing those exercises. Single leg hops, then this seems easy, you know, oh, you can hop on one leg, and that sort of thing. But can you do, you know, how far can you hop on one leg? You know, going from one leg and landing, okay, and that impact, and then doing a four corner. So if you imagine... There's like a plus pattern, landing forward, trying to balance, getting back, landing, going one side, going the other side, going the corners, okay? How many of those can they do in a minute? How quickly can they do it with good control? How many times? How many sets? Now, it feels like they're doing weights, it's so hard for the leg, but it's so important for sport. Um, and they're, you know, really beefing out their running. They can start soft sand now. Yep, but again with the soft sand, be careful if they've got a lot of patellofemoral pain and when they're going to their toes in soft sand, maybe that's not a great idea. Especially these people who love, you know, down Bondi, love being by the beach, can I soft sand rather than run the road? I really like soft sand work. Okay, wow, well, you know, some people work for it, some people won't. And shuttle. Yeah. Guys, you're just on your toe more. So when you're on a heel, you'll get a little bit more weight through the, um, through the mid part of the joint. When you're on your toe, you'll usually put more weight through the anterior part of the joint, where that cruciate ligament ends up. Right. Um, but people, people who've had patella tendon grafts will get that sort of loading, and they may not like it. But um, if you can work on it and it gets better, then fine. Shuttles, everyone knows shuttles, back and forth. Okay, working on that. You find it's actually, it's not just about running and then, oh yeah, running, 
it's actually getting down as low as you can and pushing off as hard as you can. So when they're running, getting down, pushing off, because that's what they're going to have to do for their warm-ups at training if they're playing sport. Okay, making sure they can land and twist and bend. And so this is where you pair people going back to sport. Now with athletes, like the famous Dan Carter there, best player at Brogy playing the world, right, buddy? Um, these sort of people, maybe this is four to five month mark. They might be back at three because they haven't had to go to work. They've trained three times as much as you have. Right? They might have had a Lars. Right? They've had all the massage and physio in the world, and they're a lot better than you are. So the time frame I've got up there is for our clients, yep, who are not as quick as these people. All right? But sometimes, especially if they haven't done their homework or they've not had a Lars and, and they're, they're, you know, the surgeon's a little bit more cautious, uh, depending on what type of surgery or complications they've had, you may find that they... They don't return to sport at that point. It takes them seven or eight months. Yeah? I had 12, well, I was 11. I had 11 months to get back before I was skiing, so I had a lot of time. And so I was awesome at it, you know? But I could have gone skiing at the six month mark, but it just wasn't ski season. So I was running and, you know, biking and all that sort of thing and doing all my drills. Um, you know, so those road to and heavy impact sports, don't think that everyone can get back to sport immediately, you know, even tennis players, that sort of thing. Uh, you may find cyclists are back straight away because they're just straight line work. Um, it's the rotary stuff that is very difficult for these people. Um, as far as your proprioception, I mean, you're still doing all your drills. You're still doing all that to get them up to speed and you're working on the deficits. Work on what's the most important thing for this person, not what they like doing. They might keep like, I love doing squats, but I, I just sort of, yeah, I'm not so good at that. Oh, yeah. Do I really need that? They need to work on that stuff. So make sure you, you keep promoting that. And sprints, especially for hamstring strength. Okay? The hamstring graph, they reckon it gets about 95 maximum percent ever of the other leg if you train it really, really well. That 5% you probably won't notice. But in athletes, they do notice. Yep. Any questions at that point? No? Okay. So... If you work hard enough, you will get there. Um, the thing about, this is my uh, little local ski field. You can see the little rope toes up the top there. Pretty old school. Um, I just dumped a bit of powder today. This is my first, first day back and straight into it. Now, I don't want to brag, but that is my, <laughs> that is the best I felt that season. Apart from this run, it was just my first run because I won this video my first ever run. But that season was the best strength season I've ever had skiing in my leg, and I've reconstructed. Because I've worked so much harder on it than I've ever worked before. I got my strength better than it ever was. Does that make sense? And I've got a last, so it's strong as an ox. But it just didn't feel different at all. And well, it did. It felt better than my left leg. Yeah? So you can, if you've got a goal, you can push it that hard. Um, whoops. Let's, can we get this thing going? How do I get that going? Oh. Sorry, guys. There we go. It's a bit windy today. It's my dad videoing this one. But, you know, the confidence that you get from training, even though this is my first day back, and I can't practice because there's no snow in Australia. <laughs> no. This sort of thing, you know, you just practice all the drills, all the sidestepping work. What did I have to do? I was on that ski machine, okay, doing lots and lots of work, one-legged stuff, learning how to get my confidence back. And you just, it's easy once you get going. There we go. Okay, so it can be done. Um, things to think about. You know, has your patient got a hamstring? Have they got a patella? Have they got a Lars? Try not to give advice too much on bias on what to go for. It is up to the patient. 
Okay? The surgeons always never say, you should do this, you should do that. The patient, they give the patient the information, the patient decides. It's up to the patient. All right? Hopefully... It's just very new. There's not much research behind you know, the trials and things like that. And hamstring in Australia is the gold standard. They've been doing it for a very long time. Um, and you know, it does depend on the surgeon. If the surgeon hasn't practiced the LARS, they're less likely to do it, so their person's, the option isn't there for them. Yep. And there, is you know, there's, there might be hidden complications with it. I might end up having a, you know, a bad knee later down the track. I don't know. And it's one of those things, you know, pioneer research, and, and I just went with it. So I'm not saying go with one or the other. There are benefits and pros and cons for both. Yep. Uh, the, the, tendon, the tendon does grow back, okay, but not to the full extent to what it is. And it does, you know, you do, you're losing tissue, absolutely. Um, so PTs need to work with the physio. Okay, you've got to work together. You probably see from stage one to six how important it was to keep that person on board for all that strengthening work that you had to do and how important it is to understand what exercises to do when and what stage. Yep. And it just takes experience in doing them, a lot of them, to sort of know where people are at and how hard to push them. Um, you've got, if one tip you've got to take home, you've got to keep working on your VMO. Even though I've had surgery, you know, I'm now... 18 months now. If I don't go and do my weights for three or four weeks, this starts going to sleep. Why? Who you knows? I have to keep working on it. It's like fitness. If you don't keep, keep exercising, you lose your fitness. If you had surgery in your knee, it's not the same. You have to keep making sure that your muscles are working. That's just my experience. Um, and you've got to go for those long term outcomes. So many people come and see me now for anterior cruciate ligament rehab. Oh, when did you have your, when did you have it done? Oh, two years ago. Oh, right. You see, yeah, it's still not right. I need to work on it. And we have to work on a sort of a six-month plan for them to get them better. Okay, so it's so important if you've got someone who's just had it done or you're fresh into it, you take them all the way through and so that by the end of the six months or 12 months, they know how important it is to keep their leg working, keep their leg going. And, you know, daily physio review, I mean, Weekly physio reviews, monthly physio reviews. You know, don't let that stop and try and bridge that gap. Okay? So now, the exercises we went through today, we have put them up on our website and a list of order of level one to four. So if you go to that address, uh, click on the exercise video and photo library, you'll be able to download those as PDF. Um, and like I said, this will go as a workshop where you learn sort of really one-on-one -on -one about what's happening with the exercises. Huh? Yeah, the contact information, yeah. The, there's, a, there's an exercise sheet that's gone around, I mean, a, a sheet that's gone around for the contact information. Put your name down on that if you want to learn more about our workshops and that sort of thing. And you can also like at that point there and you'll get daily updates on what we're doing. Yep. Say that again, sorry. Sorry, can you say that again? Pain during the exercise. I'd suggest you review them with the physio and work out what that pain is. Okay, is it pain because they're too weak or is it became because they're doing too much? Yep, so you need to work that one out. It does depend on what type of surgery they've had, that sort of thing as well. Okay, any questions come up? Yep. Just say how often the physio refers to the physical therapy. So you work with just the PT. Yep. They like to keep their clients. They don't like to, like, leave them. Yep, they don't want to share. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're probably not confident of what they're doing when they rehab. If they don't, if they don't give the information out, they're not really confident in what they what they don't really know what they're doing. Is there any way that a PT uh, can Yeah, especially in, well, like our like our clinic because our clinic's inside gym, so we get the if, if we've got a client that's been training, they go skiing for the winter and bust their knee, and we get the PT in. 
just as many sessions as they possibly can. Whenever they've got a free session, come and look at this. This is what we do. I want you to do this. Because it's more important for me to have a PT working on those exercises that I know that they're doing their homework. Because they're still going to come back and see me for reviews, you know, because I'm the governor of it. And the PT loves it because they've got all these new exercises to do. That person's still training with them because the biggest fear for a PT is are they going to go to the physio and then not be with me for six weeks? You know, so we make sure that, you know, the best thing for that person is to keep training because that PT will motivate the heck out of them. They trust the PT. They've got a relationship with the PT. And, you know, they can do upper body and core stuff and glute stuff that the physio gives them. So their, their PT just changed from what we were doing, fitness and strength over here. We're doing rehab for the next sort of three months. And then we'll blend back into what we were doing. So the PT's got to go to the physio. And, again, suss out the physio. Do, are they, do they know what they're doing sort of thing? You know, that sort of stuff. Yep. Okay, guys. Thanks very much.